I look back because I thought, like, how did I become an environmentalist in the first place? A lot of people love nature. You know, they go hiking or fishing and they're happy with that. But somehow, the environmental protection advocate kind of person, what, what, is a, what makes a guy like me tick? And I finally look back and I began to realize that my entire life was based around some incident when I was five years old. And we lived near my grade school. And there were this big row of, you know, really old oak trees. They're probably about 100 years old because the school was 125 years old by the time I got to it. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyway, my dad used to fight zoning fights. We lived in this little suburb close into St. Louis. Now it's called an inner suburb, but at the time it was, you know, pretty far out from the city of St. Louis. And uh, the city council had figured out if they started widening the roads in the city, they'd get a bunch of money from the federal government. And so they got involved with all these crazy projects that basically were going to ruin the, the nature of the town. And one of the things they decided to do was to make a right turn lane right in front of the school. So that, why? I don't know, because all the kids had to cross the street there. So they put in this crazy right turn lane, and in doing so, they cut down about five really beautiful oak trees that I considered my personal friends. Now you think about five-year-old, you know, we lived near a creek, we had turtles and tadpoles and stuff, and I just loved nature, and I was just, I was like despondent. You know, these were my personal friends, and they were dead. And, you know, society will tell you, okay, that's babyish, they're just trees, blah, blah, blah. That's BS. You know, we, we tell kids to stuff it, and we don't listen. And now look at the problems we're having. It's because we haven't listened to the kids. And back then I thought, my God, who the hell's in charge here? What about the adults? How could they be so stupid? I mean, think back. When you were five, you were not a dumb person at age five. You, got, you had plenty of knowledge at age five. You had a lot of wisdom at age five. You had a lot more wisdom sometimes than the grown-ups, you know, the grown-ups. And I thought, who the heck is in charge here? If the grown-ups are making this kind of decision, and I'm just five, what am I supposed to do? And I'd say that's kind of like a little grid of sand around gradually I just started building and saying, okay, well, how can I, you know, if they're not in charge, who is? You know, how do we actually deal with this tendency of the adults to take what's good and wreck it? <laughs> you know, Why? <laughs> What's behind that? And so, uh, you know, I didn't spend all my time thinking about that, but that was the beginning of my environmental career. In, in third grade, I led an anti-littering campaign, and on and, uh, and sixth grade, I led a campaign. I thought, okay, this time I'm going to beat City Hall, because they wanted to cut down another big tree, a huge 200-year-old sycamore tree right, right near my house on the street. And why? Just another road-widening project. And they decided this tree was too close to the road. And I went there, I, I, I led a petition signature. I did the, you know, what we're training, right? Petition, go talk to your elected officials. And there was in sixth grade, it was in the newspaper. I led this whole team of people. And they said, we'll get back to you on it. Well, when, guess when they got back to me on it? I got a phone call one day. It was from the logging company. They said, hey, we're cutting the tree down today. You want a slice? And I said, I don't think I need a slice of that tree. That's not the point. The point was to save the tree, not to save a slice of the tree. And it's this kind of stuff, this kind of insanity. You know, there was no need. The road was fine. Everyone liked the road. It was just they wanted the free money from the government. And that's, that's why a lot of destruction happens, just from this kind of idiotic, mindless decision-making. So, you know, let's fast forward a little bit. You know, went to high school, went to college, did my thing. You know, mostly I like to camp out, take hikes. You know, I'm not really drawn to being an activist. I'm not really the kind of person that wants to just, like, put my butt on the line all the time. I'm really kind of a, you know, I'd much rather be a passive, you know, passive user of the environment. But something about this just called me. I said, okay, somebody's got to fix this so I don't have to keep being annoyed by these kind of problems. And uh, right as I was graduating from college, I read this story about the water tables falling in, uh, in the, the wheat lands of this country. I thought, geez, this is a huge problem. What are we going to do? Nobody's doing anything about this. You know? I thought, all right. Because it's now it's time to get a job, right? You're supposed, you graduate from college, you're supposed to enter the workforce. But what I was seeing is that the workforce was causing you know, more and more environmental destruction. So I said, all right, I'm going to create a business, and that business is going to, A, not only do no harm, but every transaction is going to do some good for this problem. Okay, so here we've got water tables falling, and here I'm a kid out of college, really not that smart about business, and I said, I will sell water-saving shower heads, because <laughs> it made a lot of sense. It was something that you could sell, they were already made, 
it, you know, it made a lot of money for the customers and it made a little bit of money for me. And so there I was in my first green business at age 23 in 1983. And I went out and I started selling energy saving water uh, uh, shower heads, energy and water saving showers. They saved both energy and water. And I sold thousands of those things. And then the first compact fluorescent lights came in. Everyone goes, oh, compact fluorescent lights. I sold some of the first compact fluorescent lights in the United States of America. And it was not easy. Okay, the technology was nothing like today where you just screw it in. It was really weird. I'm not even going to go into it, but it was weird stuff. I mean, if you want, I'll tell a funny story about it. I'll tell you, i got this one funny story because this is what it took to be on the cutting edge of, the, of this sector back in 83. So there was this company, I'll... I'll they're probably out of business now, but they had come up with a... Back then, you had to take your compact fluorescent light and you plugged it into a transformer and then you turned the thing upside down and you screwed it into the light socket. And again, I sold thousands of these things. And this company had come up with this new transformer that was very compact. It was the size of a hockey puck. Back then, this was compact. If you could find a light fixture to stick this big hockey puck in a long compact fluorescent light in there, you could make a lot of money. <laughs> you know, you could find a fixture that fit. And so here I got called by the University of Missouri, 140 miles out of town, and said, okay, Mark, you've nabbed this enough, we're going to do a trial installation. And I said, great, and I called my guys in New Jersey, and they FedExed me a box of these new uh, uh, transformers, and I go there into the dorms, and I screw them in, and it's looking beautiful, and then all of a sudden this pink goo starts raining from the ceiling. It's like, what the hell is that? Guys, what'd you do? You just killed me like a ten thousand dollar sale. It's like, what'd you do? They shipped the stuff from the factory. It had each transformer had inside it this pink epoxy that kept the transformer in place and kept it from rattling. Anyway, they didn't take. They mixed it up wrong. It didn't set. They sent me a stuff, bunch of stuff that hadn't gone through any QC. And uh, you know, I get a call from the head. Of, you know, the University of Missouri, like forty thousand students. I mean, it was going to be every dorm, right? The guy says, look. We're never going to use this stuff. You know, if one fire, one child dies, it's not worth it. You know, sorry. The end. That's what it was like back then. To do anything, anything, any forward progress in this space was like that. Um, but progress I did. I eventually sold, you know, big universities, the airport. And I finally got to the point where my real nature bug kind of just got to me. I said, look, I just... Uh, I just didn't really care if another insurance company saved some money on their electric bill. It just because I was starting to get that there were much deeper issues afoot. You know, the the deforestation. People were starting to talk about the world deforestation crisis, and and that really started getting my attention. So I wrapped up that old business after eight years. It was pretty successful in its own way, and uh, I headed off to check out what's going on in the national forests. And that's like a whole other chapter here, really.